so in this module we discuss chemical engineering so to discuss chemical engineering we have uh, two faculty from uh, the department of uh, chemical engineering at iit madras who have uh, uh, joined us this morning uh, we have with us uh, professor abhijit deshpande uh, he has a phd from the university of washington uh, he has been a professor and a faculty here at iit madras uh, for 20 years now so he has a lot of experience uh, uh, in uh, teaching and carrying out research uh, in an academic setting Uh, his areas of uh, interest research areas of interest include polymers and uh, rheology uh, we also have uh, dr t ranganathan uh, he has a phd uh, in chemical engineering from uh, iit madras uh, he has been a faculty here uh, an associate professor here and uh, been with us as a faculty for 6 uh, years uh, and he is also uh, guiding all the incoming uh, phd students through their uh, initial training processes here Uh, as they get on to uh, carrying out their research uh, in the department so between them they have a lot of uh, experience uh, in uh, guiding students uh, in handling them uh, handling uh, leading them through the initial years here and uh, so perhaps uh, uh, they will be able to uh, share their experience with us uh, and tell us a uh, lot about uh, what chemical engineering is about uh, so uh, let me begin with this uh, general question uh, what are you know uh, of course chemical engineering is one of the old fields of engineering has been around for a long time uh what are typically considered as uh, traditional areas of research which have been there for a very long time in chemical engineering okay um the traditional areas would be based on let's say fluid flow heat transfer the courses which are very much familiar to the uh, undergraduate students and uh, fluid flow when i say apply to systems where we have multiple phases present well, simultaneous presence of let's say a gas bubble sparged in a a liquid column which you call as a bubble column and just like uh, students study fluid mechanics in the undergraduate we study the fluid mechanics of this multiphase systems there has been on traditional area a lot of work was uh, has been carried out across all iits uh, that was one of the traditional areas and then not alone fluid flow the mass transfer occurring in this in, uh, equipments the heat transfer and then students should be familiar with the residence and distribution studies all these aspects are uh, carried out in detail for these systems okay you yourself are an expert in uh, multi phase systems and right. gasification right okay so these are uh, so you may mentioned about traditional areas so so an incoming graduate student would uh, you know if they picked up uh, these kinds of uh, you know areas to work in uh, then there's a lot of uh, pre existing literature in uh, these areas uh, spread mm, across uh, right, several right, uh, years right. so yeah. so it, also i wanted to add that uh, sometimes uh, these very traditional areas uh, are very essential for a very new topic also for example uh, fluid flow in a microfluidic channel so again uh, uh, we have uh, lots of chemical engineering researchers doing work on this they are actually doing fluid mechanics but they are doing it for a micro channel where uh, again multi phases may be involved or we have also heat transfer uh, where uh, microwave heating is being done for a very large scale uh, sterilization or for so example, again a fluid flow in a, a fuel cell there are also the flooding phenomena as well the flooding phenomena as yeah, yeah. well even a traditional yeah. column and absorption column or you are flooding even in a uh, in a fuel cell so the uh, field of multi phase systems evolved and now applied to newer uh, newer problems, and newer, yeah. newer areas, problems like so, fuel cells yeah, and uh, yeah. microfluidic okay. so more uh, i mean uh, a good way to think about it uh, also may not be always traditional versus novel uh, in terms of area as a whole but uh, one specific topic may have a more uh, traditional feel to it versus the newer field to it depending on what precisely you are trying to do in that topic okay so okay i i mean i do understand that you know there is no you know hard and fast demarcation of uh, similarly in terms of experimentation for example uh, like gross measurements were done in terms of overall uh, measurements pressure drop and so on but uh, as it uh, evolved let's say pav measurements local local measurements were done so the depth to which measurements were done or even let's say even in terms of modeling reactor level modeling and then cfd level modeling now let's say lattice bowls and modeling so but still applied to let's say a multi phase system or a fluid flow phenomena so so the difference is in the details in details, details yeah, yeah. yeah evolution has happened both in terms of experimentation and in terms of modeling okay great yeah. so uh, i mean i do understand that you know i think across all uh, engineering divisions this is probably uh, similarly true yeah, that true. Uh, you know there's no hard and fast division between mm-hmm. you no know, old topics versus new topics right. but at the same time i mean are there uh, areas of research that you feel have you know really come up in the last let's say 5 10 years uh, which would be which people i mean consider as newer areas of research where maybe there's not enough literature from the past 
uh, and where there's a lot of yeah. new activity going on. Just before we go to the new areas, which are, uh, there, there is a couple of other examples where uh, it's the uh, old areas with a very new emphasis. And one example is something called process intensification, where the idea is that the earlier way of doing chemical processing with uh, multiple operations, can we now intensify the process in such a way that we can integrate two or three processes in one operation. Okay. So, this whole field is called process intensification where you are doing reaction and separation simultaneously uh, or, uh, or miniaturization of an equipment. Miniaturization of an equipment. So, that uh, all of this is actually again you are doing quote unquote traditional uh, work, but actually at a much more uh, efficient way, much, more, much less energy consumption, maybe much more benign in terms of environmental impact. And so, these are again examples where uh, process example, intel… Uh, for example, heat transfer as a traditional area, looking yeah. at pool boiling, flow boiling, etc. But now, same thing applied to microwave heating has taken a new yeah. view and so on. Yeah. And uh, similarly, we also have uh, systems and control, where again, uh, the controls that we can do and the systems we can analyze has uh, with our mathematical computational tools. We, we can do far more now compared to what we could do earlier and the decision making that we need to do in a chemical plant, uh, again we can do it at much more integrated scale, we can borrow ideas from signal processing that electrical engineers have developed for communication and then use them here. So again, this is again borderline of uh, uh, novel and traditional Earlier area. Earlier it was just conventional strategies that have uh, been done, later on evolved to process systems engineering yeah. which involved uh, the whole flow sheet design and then system identification, more on data analysis, as I said, integration of electrical engineering department. Okay. Now, applying the same principle to water distribution networks, uh, fuel cells, control of microfluidic devices, but still the principles are all controlled, but now okay. evolved to um, more uh, encompassing, more uh, domain, same time apply to uh, modern uh, tools, modern yeah. devices and so on. Talking about uh, new areas. Uh, we uh, generally in chemical engineering, uh, extremely exciting uh, topics are being researched. Uh, for example, polymer which we use for insulation, but these days uh, mm -hmm. devices are being made from conducting polymers. Uh, colloidal systems are being designed for photonic or drug carrier applications. Uh, drop drying which is a simple uh, fluid mechanical technique is being used to diagnose materials. Of course, with all the emphasis on uh, smart devices, uh, novel electrode materials are being prepared using nanomaterials. Excitingly also, uh, we are using bioprocessing, so using microbes to actually prepare nanoparticles. So these are all uh, exciting new areas where chemical engineering are doing more and more research these days. As important to do research on these materials, uh, how to process these materials, how to optimize them is also equally important. Uh, and uh, for example, one important area in the last uh, two decades or so has been how to process materials for semiconductor applications. Uh, we've also have uh, more and more foods coming uh, from an industrial setting instead of being done in our kitchen. So, large scale processing of food materials, for example, microwave heating, thawing of materials is an important research area. And uh, all of the topics that we have talked about so far uh, have uh, been about uh, information gathering as well as analysis at large scale, but chemical engineers uh, by definition can deal with atoms and molecules and chemical transformations. So, it is natural that we uh, work on molecular scales and very powerful simulation techniques are being used at the molecular scale to understand material behavior and their processing. When you look at a uh, postgraduate degree like a MS or a PhD, especially in engineering, uh, there is always this perception and partly true that you know we think of uh, the people who complete these degrees as being experts in that uh, area. Uh, so, uh, I mean maybe that lends itself more naturally to an academic uh, uh, setting. So, uh, but to what degree is industry interested in uh, what the uh, what research activities that go on in uh, in the general field of chemical engineering? Fine. Yeah, if you look at that, uh, the, the best way to look at that is uh, because we have talk a lot of talk about make in India now. And if you look at the sectors that uh, sort of have been uh, uh, identified as key sectors where uh, India should make uh, an impact, and a lot of investment is being sought. And so, if you look at there, are about twenty five areas which uh, the government of India has identified. And uh, if you look at uh, the sectors where chemical engineering is directly involved, uh, we have a fair bit of, there is oil and gas of course, pharmaceutical, chemical sector itself, 
but we have also uh, areas like biotechnology and uh, even wellness where uh, it's uh, let's say research related to the uh, traditional medicines so uh, in all of these chemical engineering is involved in terms of raw material processing separations and then uh, process uh, engineering and then finally uh, getting a material of a desired quality and even areas such as avionics uh, and uh, 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 electronic system, uh, there is significant research that is going on, uh, let's say for in our department, where uh, people are looking at sensors, uh, okay. either for environmental application, mm -hmm. which is a very cheap sensor, or looking at sensor in terms of trying to replace an artificial uh, muscle, where it's both sensor as well as actuator. So, such applications are being done even uh, in, in chemical engineering, and so all of these are very industry relevant topics. Example related to energy work on gasification, pyrolysis and then micro reactors as applied to pollution treatment devices all the and then okay. cfd studies apply to various chemical engineering equipments and other equip equipments as well okay so i think clearly since there's a very large chemical industry uh, uh, out, out there in, you know both nationally and internationally nationally. so i think many of the activities you do i think uh, really help them move to newer uh, levels of sophistication in how sure. they handle their yeah. activities Okay, so uh, uh, if you look at uh, you know incoming uh, MS PhD students uh, and you know the maybe the things that they are anxious about, the things that they are unfamiliar about, and so on, uh, I think maybe uh, in uh, school or college, uh, undergraduate college, there is a clear metric on you know how well they uh, or how successful they are. Right. There's always an exam, there's a grade, and there's a mark, and so on. Uh, now, when they get on to an early, to the, especially to the early part of their research career, mm -hmm. uh, I think maybe many things are not very clear. Uh, so, in your experience, I mean, having both done a PhD and now, you know, having guided many students, having spent a lot of uh, time in the uh, academic setting, uh, what would you uh, recommend students to look at as uh, ways of uh, understanding their progress in research or their success in research? Uh, how should they determine it? Uh, how should they evaluate it? And, you know, how should they, uh, you know, look at it? Okay. So, when a PhD student graduates, uh, at least the way in which we look at it is whether he has a clear understanding of what he has done, the bare minimum. And then he is able to explain that to others at different levels, maybe it, uh, uh, his own friend or a, a person before professionals at his, for, uh, working in his area. That is something bare minimum. And then next stage maybe to uh, identify the scope of the work he has done, he should know the limitation. Any research is not complete, so he should know the boundary within which he has done his work. That immediately sets him the goals for his future research as well. So, he can identify research topics or research areas to work on. And then, of course, um, he is able to um, carry out research independently so that he can take up students when he go, takes an academic career, especially. All those are good uh, metrics which you can, which you can say that he is a successful researcher at the end of his PhD program. Okay. Yeah, and also as a, of course, uh, given that uh, in research it's important to communicate our ideas, uh, we, we have to have uh, publications that come out of uh, research and uh, so there has to be a fair uh, representation of his ideas in the open literature by communicating some okay. papers and having mm -hmm. some papers at the end of the PhD. Okay, so that, uh, that uh, I mean, uh, sets the standard in terms of, you know, it's a piece of work that they have carried out that is uh, peer reviewed, accepted right. by like the peer group yeah. and uh, so on. Yeah. Okay. Fine. So, um, um, again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, typically students finishing MS and PhD are considered, uh, you know, experts in that area. So, uh, what sort of uh, positions do they tend to get? What sort of, uh, you know, placement or positions do they tend to get after an MS or a PhD degree in uh, chemical engineering? So, it varies. Uh, they basically uh, 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 further research work. So, for example, MS going on to PhD or PhD going on to postdoctoral work is one uh, set of uh, then the other is uh, in terms of academic positions. So, master students can also join a teaching position and a PhD student can also join an academic uh, research teaching position and uh, then industrial R&D. So, uh, the, the mix is usually all of these. Uh, depending on some years, for example, uh, in 2000, uh, 2005 period, uh, my perception was that a lot of them were joining industrial R&D because there was an expansion of uh, industrial R&D in India. Uh, in the last uh, few years, uh, we have seen that there have been more academic positions. But again, that might change depending on, uh, in our lab, for example, recently two, three people have joined industry again. 
So depending on the group, uh, the topic that you do, as well as uh, depending on the time when you graduate, uh, depending uh, the uh, mix of these three vary. Further okay. studies, further research, uh, academic position or industrial R&D. And few even have ideas of entrepreneurial thing. Yeah. And okay, very nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. nice to know that and My own student is planning to start an entrepreneurial very and then nice. identifying ideas to set okay. up his okay. own. Uh, Great. Yeah. Okay. So now, uh, see, if you look at the mix of students who come into engineering departments and certainly into chemical engineering and so on, so they come from various backgrounds, uh, different types of, uh, you know, training that they have had mm -hmm. and so on. Um, and they are coming into a, in an academic setting which maybe has its own culture and uh, processes in place. Uh, are there uh, specific issues that students tend to face, uh, not just in our department, but in generally in chemical engineering uh, uh, as a whole, when they come in for postgraduate studies? Is there something in the undergraduate study that is not, uh, you know, completely preparing them for uh, postgraduate kind of study in the in chemical engineering? Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, what sort of approaches then they would they would need to take to you know overcome those uh, shortcomings? Okay, so the first one can be done. Uh, in terms of the coursework, what they take in their institutes and then in IIT. The number of courses may be less here, but then the rigor, the level of uh, analysis that is being done in any course is very detailed. So they will have to almost like climb up uh, to get to that level of uh, attending classes and then analyzing and then submitting assignments and so on. So rigorousness of coursework is one I would say. For the graduate school, it is always much different compared to an undergraduate. Right, right. that's right. Uh, and then of course, um, in terms of exposure to computation and techniques, not uh, let's say MATLAB or a CFD tool or a simulator tool and so on, uh, that is almost like pa integrated part of few courses here. And uh, having known them will be very useful to just take on rather than learn that after coming here, that is uh, one. Now once again, uh, the students are introduced to the lab later classes in their, as part of the beach, UG curriculum, but there uh, they may not pay attention to preciseness, accuracy and repeatability and so on, just a lab class. But now when they start a MS program or PhD program where enough detail, attention has to be paid to the experiment, the way in which it's carried out, the preciseness, r repetition, they should gear up for that as well. Which is, we don't expect to UG uh, graduate to get trained for that. Just part of the undergraduate lab. So that is one. The way in which they look at experiments, it should be different. Okay. So there's something of retuning their mindset and yeah. uh, approach. It, yes. Yeah. So. But one other important uh, retuning that has to be done is uh, at two different uh, levels. One is uh, always going back to an undergraduate course as a starting point. Uh, to think about any set of research area and all that, that may not be always very useful. So, like we already said, so say I want to do in heat transfer may not be a very useful idea because what you have to see is what are the research area related to heat transfer and they might require very different fields for you to work on that topic. So, even though notionally it might seem like there is heat transfer involved in the topic, it may not be related to the undergraduate subject that you have done. So you need to delink little bit of your aspirations for research with respect to the coursework that you have done. It's a good starting point, but it is not going to be uh, because uh, as we always keep it on saying, if it's, if it's in the book, uh, then it's not really research. Then uh, so something much more than what we have been exposed to as coursework will be involved in research. The other extreme of it is to sort of uh, uh, be completely swayed by the new buzzwords of uh, nanotechnology. Uh, again, uh, that's not again is something we should. Always, uh, we, we can examine research topics for their details and things like that and then pursue them rather than get swayed saying that, oh, I am working in nanotechnology, so by definition, whatever I will do will be groundbreaking. Because in the end, you will have to, uh, as we said, uh, you will have to learn techniques, you will have to understand, you will have to be able to explain, you will have to be able to achieve uh, new results, uh, 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 generate new results and then analyze them and communicate. So all those are very important rather than either just harping back on one course subject or looking at a very hot new area. Okay. So much more holistic, so that we, we, we should be, as a researcher, we should be tuned to looking at in a more holistic way rather than pigeonholing uh, our own research topics or our own research areas. 
Okay. So, I mean, I think in in this, uh, all the points that you have made about, uh, you know, how uh, the view of a student should uh, change and evolve as they become a graduate student. Uh, I think one of the things of, uh, uh, in a postgraduate study, uh, life as a postgraduate student, uh, is the fact that, you know, a, a fair part of your uh, learning process, uh, part of your performance is also got to do with, uh, you know, how well uh, you interact with the rest of uh, your group, how well you interact with your advisor and so on. So, in this context, you know, so, sort of in a mundane way, uh, how often do you think students should really meet their advisor? I mean, is there like a guideline that you give and what what, what are you looking at in, in this kind of a scenario? Uh, you come to the point, meeting advisor, uh, the frequency of meeting uh, changes as he progresses along the program. So, let's say initial one year, he may be meeting very frequently and then for everything, he may just go to the guide and so on, meet him. And as progress, and other than that, of course, all faculty usually have weekly a formal uh, meeting with the student. Other than that, of course, he can meet him anytime, and anytime required and so on. So, as the years progress and then the number of meetings gradually come down and then, so also from the student point of view to become more independent, not to approach the guide for every in small thing uh, which he comes across. And uh, one more point of meeting guide I would say is he should go and meet his guide when he is not getting results let's say for a prolonged period of time. Either the results may be wrong or something interesting maybe would have happened there. So, the guide uh, based on his research experience can identify whether it is a wrong observation or something interesting. Student should not be in a shell that uh, it's something wrong, he should not be afraid and to go and meet the guide. So, these are the things I would uh, yeah. say. And also, uh, uh, the other uh, big, uh, uh, other uh, 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 situation that we are in as a researcher is actually we will have not just the advisor but a whole lot of other people working around us. So, it is a good idea to develop uh, this habit of talking to your own uh, other uh, research scholars and, and because so that is a good sounding board also. So, not only should we meet advisor very regularly as Ranga mentioned uh, and every week is uh, probably very good in the beginning and maybe it can become uh, once in two weeks if let us say you are progressing very well and you are doing very well. Uh, but once in a week is certainly a good idea, but also it is a good idea to every month at least uh, sit down with uh, one of your colleagues and then try to discuss and try to see some broad uh, results of what you have got, are you thinking along in the right direction. If you are planning a major uh, initiative, maybe just discuss with two other students in the lab and see, you know, this is what I am thinking about. Before I meet the advisor, I want to check with you. So, such exchange of ideas not only with your advisor, but with your peers is a very good idea. And uh, uh, the less he depends on the guide towards the end, instills him more confidence in him that he can do independent research. So, that he can do independently and he not do, and at the same time develop some more ideas for his future, future research and so on. Okay. So, you are recommending that they slowly evolve to becoming yeah. independent yeah. and that is something that they should look forward to. Yeah. In oh. fact, you are asking how do you judge? One judge is uh, of uh, how success is full successful he is. So, suppose he knows more than his guide at yeah. towards the end, that is a big mark for us that uh, okay. we are happy that… specialized in that area. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so, I think we will, uh, I would like to conclude by asking you a, a very general question. Uh, you know, there are a lot of students out there uh, who right. are looking forward to uh, careers in research and research in chemical engineering. What are your words of advice for an aspiring chemical engineering postgraduate student? Right. So, as you were, Abhijit was mentioning, uh, the we work in the recent areas of uh, chemical engineering, but the principles involved are still based on our fundamentals of fluid mechanics, mass transfer, and so on. So our interview process, uh, selection process, we do test the fundamentals only. Of course, first we have a uh, shortlisting and then a written test and then an interview process. Both in the written test and the interview process test the fundamentals. So uh, it's good for them to be very good at the fundamentals so that they are successful in the admission process and that is one uh, major and then uh, they as he said they should not distinguish between the fundamental courses and the research areas what it, we are we are doing in so it's better to go through a website and then get familiar at least have some glance what kind of research is going on so that they know that they should not be looking from a fluid mechanics or mass transfer point of view but Look at topics where these principles are uh, involved. Mm, that's yeah. In my uh, general uh, ad advice uh, is not specifically related to students per se, but uh, generally been broad comment about chemical engineering as a discipline, uh, uh, saying that you know chemical engineering is one of those few uh, engineering areas where uh, molecules are still at the center of our considerations. 
So, so therefore, uh, going from uh, molecular scale all the way till engineering scale, uh, wherever molecular transformations are involved, chemical engineering will be involved. So, with that in mind, if you approach chemical engineering research, you can see boundless uh, sort of opportunities. And that is why we showed you how we make in India also out of 25 areas, there are 13, 15 areas where chemical engineering is centrally involved. So, therefore, uh, if you are uh, sort of looking and considering a career in chemical engineering research, go for it. I would say it is going to be very promising uh, with all the developments that are happening in uh, processes, materials, energy, uh, everywhere chemical engineering will actually play a role. So, there will be a lot of scope for R&D in chemical engineering in future also. Okay, great. On that positive note, uh, thank you Abhijit for joining us. Thank you Ranga yeah, for joining us thank and you. sharing your insight on this. Thank you.